Hey everyone, welcome back to New Method Live. And today I have a special treat for you guys. Usually you just have me talking to you during the episode, but I really wanted to bring on a special guest. And I plan to do this every once in a while when I meet a special human because I want to share the special humans that I meet with you guys. So today's episode, I'm going to be introducing Dr. John Spagnalo, and I'll tell you more about him, but he's amazing. He's a cardiologist that was trained in conventional medicine, but over time realized that there is so much more than what he was taught in school. So in a moment, I'm going to bring him on. I'm going to introduce him and I'm going to let you guys enjoy the show. So for those of you on Facebook, let me know that you're here. You ask questions. My team is going to be looking. Um, if you're watching us on the replay, type the word replay, let us know. On YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe because it's so kind and it makes us feel so good. And if you're listening on the podcast, uh, don't stop uh, washing your dishes or mowing your lawn. Of course, my hair always looks fabulous. I'm wearing a gray sweater. Dr. Spagnala, which I'll introduce in a moment, is wearing a white coat, a lab coat. And as always, I'm wearing a stethoscope that my wife bought me. So today we're going to talk to Dr. Spagnala. Let me do a brief intro on him. He is so humble that he sent me like two sentences. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Dr. Spagnala is an interventional cardiologist based out of his native borough of Staten Island. He is the Associate Director of the Cardiology Fellowship at Staten Island University Hospital and an assistant professor of cardiology at Hofstra Zucker School of Medicine. He completed his training at SIUH and Lenox Hill Hospitals. Clinical areas of interest include cardiac prevention, cardiac imaging, cardiogenic shock, and coronary interventions. So he's a total lightweight. Welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I, I'll please, this is like an awesome conversation. I know we're about to have amongst friends. So this is going to be so, so, so cool. Oh my God, this is so exciting. So I just want to tell you guys how I met Dr. Spagnalo and why I wanted him on my show. So I was dealing, I was working with a patient, um, uh, a younger patient, and I gave him some advice regarding his cholesterol. And this patient and his father called me back and said, you know what, our cardiologist does not agree with you. And, you know, and I was like, okay, well, let me talk to your cardiologist. And I was really nervous. I was nervous because I was like, oh, you know, I'm into this functional medicine stuff. And this cardiologist who's going to be conventional medicine is going to like chew my head off for doing this. Um, and so I picked up the phone, like I was 12 years old. I was like, Hello, <laughs> Dr. Spagnala. <laughs> I really did. <laughs> and this is what he said. Oh my God, I'm so excited to talk to you. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> I remember this day and I was like, and because the patient's dad had texted me and it was like, is it okay if you guys talk? I'm like, absolutely, please. It's encouraged. <laughs> so, so, so actually we didn't disagree. The messaging got crossed between the patient and us. And he was like, actually, I think everything he's doing is great. Let's go out for dinner. And so we did. Um, and here we so, are. And here we are. And Dr. Spagnall and I went out for dinner with both of our wives' blessings. And it was, <laughs> disc <laughs> and it was discovered that we are... Um, kindred spirits on the topic of medicine and health. And it is very rare that we have someone who is so entrenched in conventional medicine. I mean, you've gone to schooling and more schooling and more schooling, and then to suddenly kind of see the light and come over to this side. So tell me a little bit about that. So um, from like, ever since I wanted to go like into medical school, I always like thought heart stuff. And I had always thought that this was going to be something that I wanted to do. I have like familial heart disease in my family. So it was something that I had always kind of wanted to get more interested. And it was always like the part of medical school that wound up interesting me. And then I started my training and I was really, really, really into uh, coronary, prevent, uh, uh, coronary interventions. So I am the guy that gets called in the middle of the night to put stents in people who are having heart attacks. I love it. I know that sounds like a totally psychotic thing to love, <laughs> but uh, I, so I, I deal with the sickest of the sick and I deal with them when they're like, when, uh, when they're at their worst and they get better, the majority of them, and they get better pretty quickly. So from like a reward standpoint, it's absolutely rewarding. But then I started thinking, you know, wouldn't it be great if this just didn't happen? And this was before I was waking up in the middle of the night to like go and do this. <laughs> Imagine prevention. Uh, Wouldn't it be great if there, we could prevent this? Exactly. So Crazy uh, concept. Totally crazy concept, especially, I, I don't know, I feel like an American diet is not exactly conducive to this in any way, shape, or form. 
Um, so I did a deep dive into like prevention and doing this, which I, I, I get it. Like the conventional person who's watching this is like, dude, that's bad for your business. But like, I don't care. I don't want it. Like people are going to have heart attacks, like regardless of whatever you do, but we can reduce the frequency. We can reduce the magnitude. We can reduce um, the overall number. Um, and Staten Island is a pretty unique place to kind of practice for that because there are, there are an obscene amount of heart attacks on Staten Island. I think we get like, wow. yeah. So uh, we get about, I think last year we did 120 like emergent heart attacks. And then you have like the minor heart wow. attacks, which are like, yeah. So for an island of 600,000 people, it's a lot. And I don't know, kind of forced me to do a deep dive into A, what was wrong with my lifestyle and B, what was wrong with a lot of the lifestyles of the patients that we had kind of dealt with. And how can we manage that? How can we mitigate that? And how do we form a partnership? That's really how how I look at this. And the partnership is not just between me and you because we have a bunch of mutual patients, but it's also, it's with, it's with, it's with your patients too. And that's, I, I kind of look at our role as educators as yes. uh, and not really dictators in terms of how <laughs> I want to practice medicine. I, I know this is like totally weird and, off, and totally off base. It's crazy. It's absolutely like, insane. I know, but it shouldn't be. I know it shouldn't be. But you told me that something happened and you read, like an article or something you stumbled upon the concept of inflammation. Yes. So um, I remember this patient very vividly. She, she was a lady with lupus. I had seen her like multiple times in the hospital and no one took her chest pain seriously. They just thought that it was because of, uh, oh, she has a chronic inflammatory state. Mm. And one day, like one admission, we finally brought her up to the cath lab and she had horrendous coronary disease. And so I was like, her cholesterol's fine. All of her other risk factors are managed well. So like what led to this? She had no family history of anything cardiac. And it just caused, it forced me to do a deep dive into inflammation, into cholesterol management, uh, not just management, but also metabolism and how all of these things play a much bigger role than we were taught in medical school. Like uh, to me, the craziest thing about medical school is like they do not teach you anything about diet, nutrition. They just tell you to send people to a nutritionist. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And, and it, it just seems bananas to me. <laughs> so, so, so you discovered this, you discovered that in her case, she wasn't eating horrendously. She, uh, she was actually very big into diet and, and, and into prevention in terms of like minimizing her symptoms that she was getting from her lupus. Um, and at the time I didn't pay it any mind. I was like, I have no idea what that is because again, nothing to that point in my training or experience had led me to do that. And, uh, since then, and I'm happy to say that there's been a big growth in, uh, especially within the cardiology community, um, into exploring this into, and into exploring, you know, what are all these inflammatory pathways? What are all of these things that could potentially contribute to this. And, and a big piece of that is, so uh, every single patient I sleep, I talk, I see, I talk about diet, exercise, sleep. And yes, sleep was yes. like another new concept. That oh, I yes. kinda... Wait, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about sleep. <laughs> I just did actually a, a TikTok and I said, if you're out here eating gluten-free ice, but you're not sleeping, it's not going to work out for you. No, nothing works. <laughs> nothing works if you're not sleeping. But now, now they're looking to inflammatory, but when you discover this, I think you told me you were like, oh my God, I kind of stumbled on the fact that inflammation is the thing. And I think you told me you found another colleague. Yes. Uh, uh, so I found another colleague who kind of, uh, who was into this and he was like, you need to read up about, about whatever uh, Valentin Fuster is doing, is going into And he's like, He's like the world's cardiologist. He's like from Catalonia, Spain. He's like the director of of all of uh, of all of cardiology for Mount Sinai Hospital, but he's very big into prevention too. So I just started absorbing as much of this as I possibly could, and I, I would take and read articles from wherever, whether it was a nutrition journal, whether it was from, uh, frankly, up until like the last couple of years, not a lot of cardiology journals nope. either. I want to I want to interrupt you for a moment because it's really important what you said is so significant because for those of you listening you know you get frustrated with your providers but we did not learn this in school and I when I tell my story also when I first started primary care people came in and said well I don't feel well I'm like well your labs are fine have a nice day and <laughs> and in your you know like I can't help you everything's fine we're not anemic your, your thyroid is good see you next year um and you have to 
make a decision. Something has to spark you and you have to be crazy enough to keep studying, <laughs> right? So you spend your spare time reading these articles. I spend my spare time going to the vortex of functional medicine. But the people who come with, once, once you kind of open up Pandora's box, you can't unsee it. No. But you can't. But it also requires a certain amount of dedication on your part because you're spending time reading things that are not, you know, putting money in your pocket. They're not changing anything for you. You could be like, no, forget it. I don't care. But you care so much that you spend your time reading this. And that's really, I just wanted to stress that for a moment. I don't want to gloss over it. No, and and I I think it's a big thing. I think the, uh, I think our primary role as providers is to care, and and I, and I'm not just talking about a lab value. I'm not just talking about you know fixing something and then, oh great like you're fixed you're fine like you, you need to take care of people and you need to take care of patients and that's I don't know, that's kind of what is at the core of me. I mean I I, I get it pretty yes. early on in my career, but. <laughs> Uh, I don't, I've been this way for 36 years. I'm not changing. Like this is, this is just who I am. Uh, before, I, before I like went into this, I, I thought I was going to wind up going into finance. It just wasn't fulfilling. Um, mm -hmm. And luckily now I have a career where I can treat people from prevention through intervention and kind of get a full sense of what everything was like. So how do you like, manage that. I, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. I, I just did an episode about why the healthcare system is designed to keep us sick and not in a conspiratorial way, but the fact that the healthcare system is designed for codes. Did you do a procedure? Did you do the thing? Put the code in. And there really is no coding for spend time with a family and figure out what they're eating, spend time with, you know, there's no, there's no real room for prevention and spending the time and things that you said, sleeping and eating. How do you manage to do that within the constraints of the system? So I have very understanding partners. Uh, and <laughs> That's the key right there. It's, it's the key. And I'm not just talking about, uh, about my wife. I'm talking about like the people who I work with every day. So like they hear me go on about my spiels and my rants. And um, I spend extra time with patients. And I, I, I get it from like a, from a cost and uh, income thing. Like we get paid the same amount whether we talk to you for five minutes or whether we talk to you for an hour doesn't make a difference um but changing you and changing how everything can uh how everything plays into you know we're, we're gonna get into cholesterol i promise everybody yes. but uh <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh but to make real change you have to spend time with people and i like the relationship aspect of it i like uh getting to know my patients i ask them about their families i, I, I and to me it's like, how do you trust me if you meet me for 15 minutes? Uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, so true. Uh, and trust me with your so heart. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's not so like it's not your uh, foot, on, it's not your toe, it's your heart. <laughs> so like I, I I was on I was on call for heart attacks yesterday, and I like I, this is just a funny story, like from today. So I, I spent like an hour talking to him and his story, like like today, like yesterday, like while we were doing all these things, I was not asking him about his family. I was like, I just need to open your artery and like, we're going to be fine. But I spent like about 45 minutes today, like in between procedures and was just chatting up this guy. He, he is, he's such an amazing person. But when I was walking out of the room, uh, one of the nurses was just like, wow, you were in there the whole time. And I was like, yeah. He was like, he was like, oh, you must have really examined them. I'm like, no, we were just chatting. We just talking. wanted to make sure he was okay. Just talking. Wanted to hear about his family. He wanted to see mine. We exchanged pictures. He has grandkids. I have, I have children. So we were just, and I, I don't know. That's how you, I, to me, what's going to make a bigger difference in this guy's life? Yes, I get it. Opening up his artery, fine. But what is going to make him want to talk about these other things? That's not my, my goal. For me, this is, this is how I get fulfillment out of this too. It's not all just selfless. Um, but he's, he's going to make real changes to his life. And that's amazing. It's cool. Yeah. I mean, not to sound all woo woo, but you, there's a higher power. Um, there's a higher calling, there's a higher power. And that, that is the driving force, um, for you and everyone on, and that's not to say people in convention medicine don't care. Of course they do, but to make that leap and to dive into it and then to change your practice because of it, I've done the same, um, it's just, you're just answering to a different calling. And if you think about it, like financially speaking, it's counterintuitive because you're doing everything you can to keep them off your table. <laughs> so, so it's counterintuitive, but, <laughs> but it actually works because people come to you because they love you. Um, 
<laughs> so good. Okay, so the topic I really wanted to talk about is cholesterol because there is so much nonsense out there about cholesterol. So let's start with just a refresher because not everyone knows you know, what cholesterol is, what we believe, and, and why we think it is, you know, the thing that we have to watch out for, for heart disease. Let's talk about like the before you discovered what you discovered. So I, I, cholesterol is, was always kind of known to be this, I don't want to say always, this is like all like the last like 40, 50 years, but cholesterol was always known to be a risk factor. And it, it started off as an association, the way we kind of view everything. And then the research kind of evolves uh, through that. So we noticed that everybody was having heart attacks, had high levels of circulating cholesterol, more so their LDL or their bad cholesterol. And, le- and if they had higher levels of their HDL, people seemed to do better and had less ri- risk of atherosclerosis. And basically it's just, it's lipid byproducts that are s- swirling around in your blood, schmutz for lack of a better uh, <laughs> schmutz, term for I love it. it. Uh, and, it's cholesterol schmutz. I, I don't know. I'm from Brooklyn. This is just how I talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that those circulating particles are, um, what we've come to know recently are that they are very pro-inflammatory and they get activated and oxidized whenever there are free radicals, reactive ox- uh, oxidant things that are going wait, on. Wait, wait, wait. I'm yeah, going yeah. to stop you because you're using, using big words and I want to make sure everyone's clear with us. Gotcha, we also gotcha, made the gotcha, transition. Sorry. So first, for me, not for my audience, my audience is super smart. You know, I just need things broken down. So um, I just want to first say that what you're saying, and I don't want to gloss this over, is that you had people who were having heart attacks. Yes. And you happened to find out that that elevated cholesterol. So a decision was made that, oh, this must be the reason. It must be the reason that if we see high levels of cholesterol, therefore we're having heart attacks, right? Correct. That was that was the connection. And so this is why we're all chasing to bring the cholesterol down because this must be the reason we made this this link. So that is carried us over, uh, carried, still carries many people. But you're saying that what we've discovered recently is that it's not the cholesterol, but rather what is it? So it's it's the cholesterol plus the inflammation. And whether or not the cholesterol that's circulating and, and inflammation can be from anything. It could be from infections. Stress leads to extra inflammation in your body. And and to, uh, I hate labeling stress as a risk factor for heart disease, even though we all know it. But it's such a subjective term. Like, I don't know. Uh, we all respond to situations differently. And we're all, we all can handle certain things in different ways. But our bodies handle things in different ways, too, to different extents. So there's no way that I can say that my stress is different from your stress or different from somebody else's stress. But it's there. And it, we know that it definitely plays a role. Um, you can kind of test this by looking for um, inflammatory markers and re- uh, in, in blood work. And recently, we've identified a few that are more specific for heart inflammation and kind of lead us in the, into that realm. But there's inflammation that you're getting from everything, your diet, chronic inflammatory conditions. Like to date, like I would love to see rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, believe it or not, even like HIV, because you literally have an infection that's swirling around in your body for forever, even if it's managed well, but it's still a chronic inflammatory state. And all of the, I would love to like group these together and get the research and know that because we see it in clinical practice, but it's not like one of the traditional risk factors that you think of, but the commonality between all of these different risk factors, whether it's high blood pressure, whether it's diabetes, whether it's stress, uh, whether it's diet, whether it's cholesterol is inflammation. 100%. So are you saying that if two people have the same cholesterol number? but one of them has less informa- inflammation, they are less, they will have a lower risk factor than someone with inflammation, whether or not we can quantify that right now, but that is, is that what yes. you're saying? Okay. Bringing down it's, your inflammation will decrease your risk for heart disease, period. <laughs> period. Exactly. And anyone who's watching me knows that everything I talk about is inflammation. So if I had to choose my specialty, it's inflammationology. Uh, <laughs> inflammation, I think that's a good word. Um, I like it. Thank you. Because like you said, everyone, I treat patients now all over the country. 
And I should say I coach patient because I can't, um, you know, take care of them across state lines. So I coach patients all over the country and they have, they come to the table, like you said, some of them with RA, some of them with lupus, some of them with Crohn's and some of them just aches and pains. And they've all been told, by the way, kind of like your lupus patient in one form of, an, of another that, oh, it's all in your head because, you know, it's all in your head. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> no, <I'm sorry. laughs> and the common denominator for all of them is inflammation. And this is why I can work with them in a methodical way because our goal is to reduce their inflammation. And when we reduce inflammation, oh my God, the aches and pains go away, their flare ups go away, their skin gets better, their headaches get better. And it turns out, based on this conversation, that we've also lowered their cardiac risk. Without question. Without question. And it, it, it's, it's interesting now that my lens has kind of changed. I noticed that, you know, the traditional risk factors also lead to increased inflammation. There we go. So, so like, <laughs> uh, so like, um, uh, so people who have uncontrolled diabetes, whether it's with medicines, whether it's with diet, like also higher risk of inflammation. And of course that's going to affect your coronaries because inflammation is the common denominator. Same thing happens with high blood pressure. Same thing happens with stress. Same thing happens with the different types of food that you may eat. Now, I'm going to have full disclosure. My favorite food is cheese. I do not have it every day because of what I know. It can possibly be the worst thing you could have for yourself. But I, 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 I got to scratch the itch. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. I tell my patients that it's okay to live in the gray because it's really hard to be 100%. So, you, you know, you stay as tight as you can and then enjoy a moment and then you hop right back on. It's okay. I completely it's never black agree with that. Never no, it. and it, it, you got to like, I'm doing this so you can live. I'm out, mm-hmm. I, I don't want to get in the way of you and, and living to me is, you know, what happens between visits living is I want you to feel good. I want you to mentally be good and be well, but I also want you to enjoy yourself. I'm not yes. doing this. So that way you can not enjoy yourself. Do, do this. Like, like I will fix you, uh, like, but, <laughs> but you got to fix yourself and like, just, I want people to enjoy themselves and I don't want people to think that like, you know, yes, because I have X diagnosis or, or Y diagnosis, I can't enjoy. You have to. Yes. So there's there, we just don't need to do it every day, every meal. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think that's a difference. So, you know, I tell my patients all the time and I purposely also post it on my social media when I'm out with my family to show people I live a normal life because it is not possible to be regimented all the time. But if you're 85%, 99%, that's pretty damn good on the inflammation scale. <laughs> yeah. The majority of people live in the opposite direction where they're good 5% Correct. of the time, 10% of the time, <laughs> and then 95% of the time, it's just total chaos. It's total <laughs> chaos. It's total chaos. And, and by the way, I'm glad you mentioned stress. And yes, it's subjective. Um, and there is nobody who has a stress-free life. And that's definitely not what we're saying. It's really about learning how to manage your stress. And it's not my area of expertise. So whether that means going to therapy or whether it just means taking a moment, going outside and inhaling and exhaling, because we forget to breathe sometimes. Seriously. Um, or just let out a primal thing. scream if you have to, too. Like for me, yeah, that's very exactly. therapeutic. <laughs> so that's what we mean when we say managing stress. We don't mean live a stress-free life. It doesn't exist. It's not possible. Um, not possible. But tell me what you discovered also about sleep that you happened to mention it. So sleep to me, so I, I ask everybody like a laundry list of questions and I, I, I forewarn my, uh, my patients before and I'm like, I'm about to ask you a bunch of weirdo questions now that you, you didn't come here for. <laughs> uh, so I always ask, um, uh, describe a, re- a regular day to me from the time you wake up until you go to bed. And then I fill in the gaps with the things that I really care about. Um, but the things I'm looking for are, what is your support structure like? Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you eat and when do you eat? So I think the when of when you eat is also very important as a, 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 in addition to what you eat. But then I also talk about sleep, uh, sleep quantity and sleep quality. So the easiest way for me to ask is, do you dream? So I Ooh. ask how many hours do you get a night? And then I ask, do you dream? And then it usually leads, uh, I've had some weird answers to that question. It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, Don't tell me your some- dreams. I just want to know if you dream. No, they all tell you their dreams after you. Like, you're going to get that, like, <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> um, but uh, when people dream, they go into, into a deep sleep or REM sleep. And it's, I liken it to, it's your body rebooting in safe mode. But um, 
in terms of rebooting, but it reboots everything. It reboots your uh, metabolism. It reboots your inflammatory cycle. It reboots uh, and recharges you for the day after. So uh, it's, to me, it plays a huge role in overall body inflammation. And in addition to that, overall, I don't want to say health, but well-being. The like people who sleep six to eight hours a night and get good quality sleep um, typically feel better in the day. Like I, I, I don't know how else to describe it. Um, and I want to add two more things to that. So, and I'm sure you know this, but you know, for those listening, your brain is so metabolically active. So think of a city and there's a lot of hustle and bustle. At some point, somebody has to pick up the garbage. So this metabolic waste has to be cleaned up and that happens at night. So growth hormone, which is when we're little makes us grow, but when we're, uh, you know, adults, it actually repairs is released at night when we're sleeping. Um, but you know, if none of this matters to you, all you have to think about is this, when you miss one night of sleep and you're super grumpy, that's obvious to you. And if over time you're missing a little bit of sleep every night, you're just kind of getting, you're losing your edge over time. And suddenly you look back and you say, wow, I'm not as sharp as I used to be. And part of that is because for the past 20 years, you haven't been sleeping. So it's, it's a big part of it. And I don't know if you're familiar with some work for Alzheimer's, but whether we're talking about prevention for Alzheimer's or reversing of some symptoms, it, sleep is mandatory. You, you cannot reverse the symptoms of dementia if, if there's a possibility of reversing them or prevent it if you're not sleeping for precisely yep. these reasons. Um, that's big. And then you mentioned when they eat. What did you mean by that? To me, the biggest thing is having a fasting window before you go to sleep. And it's really, uh, and I say four hours. You're the expert in this though. <laughs> I mean, a minimum of three hours. I agree with you from you when go. you last eat to when you go to sleep. And, and to me, it's basically, it's, it's about how your body processes the food that you eat, the nutrients that you get and where it's going to go. So if you give yourself four hours, you will utilize that energy that you've taken in as opposed to if you, if you have a carton of ice cream and then you go to bed, uh, all of that is just going to go into your fat stores. You're going to be inflamed all night. You're not going to get good quality sleep. Not sleeping. And, and you're going to feel like crap the next day. Yeah, no, look, you like could do that sometimes, but if you do yes. it every day, problems. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. And then you also mentioned relationships and I, that support structure is so important. One of the things that happens to our elderly, one of the reasons that they go into cognitive decline, among other things, is because of social isolation. And completely agree. You know, and we tend to look at like that, and you're like, well, that, that's not me. But if you're slowly isolating, going out less and less, you know, interacting less and less for whatever reason, before you know it, that person you're looking at becomes you, and you're suddenly socially isolated, and that has such an effect on your health. Again, one of the things we never talk about. Um, yeah, you, and, and, and I, I uh, so my, my grandma's 86. I love her. Uh, but she, she's had like some freak health issues this year and she's been like very, very, very isolated and like almost she's fine now, but like it, during like the time where this was like, she just, she exhibited a bunch of like very needy behavior and I, I mm. didn't really understand it. And I think a lot of it was just, she she was totally independent and she threw out her back. I'll say it. Okay. Um, but she <laughs> we love you, um, Grandma. Love you, Grandma. Margie Great. <laughs> um, but she um she had a, a big issue with like finding her motivation because her independence was gone. Her she lived like a very social life. Like she would go out to like lunch with like all her friends like every single day, like like the whole mm -hmm. week. And she I don't think it was conscious, but she started needing like she, her body was craving that human interaction. And I think if this had gone on longer, like I think this that the natural progression of this would have been uh, that she would have had some cognitive decline and yes. had issues like that. And like, it's easy to see how these things can start. Yes. Um, and, and part of it is uh, family dynamics changing, different situations with other portions of your health and it's i don't know it's scary yeah so if you were taking of someone elderly make sure they stay connected get them in a group they're not going to want to go take them anyway it's it's, it's going to help no matter what <laughs> even just call them call them 
Yeah, call them, bring them to dinner, let them sit there. Even if, you know, sometimes they don't have much to contribute, uh, especially if there's a lot of different generations at the table, that's okay. The neurons are firing in the presence of the younger generation, you bring them in. Um, it's, it's so important. I just, I just wanna say this before, before I let you go, is that, you know, a lot of times people say to me, is this alternative medicine, what I'm doing, functional medicine? And I'm like, absolutely not, no. because all of our guidelines, every single guideline that you read in your, your Hippocrates are up to date. The first thing says lifestyle modifications. Yep. And then they talk about the medication. It's just that in our industry, we skip the lifestyle modification and go straight to medication. And I think where you and I are, it's not alternative. Of course, if you need medication, we're going to give it to you. This is first line. But the first line therapy of every disease is lifestyle modification. Tell me why we skip it. <laughs> uh, so I, I think this probably has to do with what, what you were talking about before, where like, you know, the, the care and medicine is gone. And there's always so many things you could tackle in a 15 minute visit. Yeah, yeah. And, and we are, uh, and like, you know, however the medical industry is situated, like we've arrived at this point. So, and I don't think it's unique to lifestyle changes. I think historically the way that we responded to pain, like, you know, mm. 15 years ago, uh, there was no fifth vital sign, which is, you know, you have to assess your pain at every, at every visit. Also 15 years ago is when pharmaceutical companies came out with opioids and you're not going to sit there for 15 minutes trying to examine why everybody has back pain. Half of all medical visits are, are related to some form of back pain, which is sure. bananas. Bananas. So, Maybe it's because it, we're sitting so much. No. Okay. No, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think in a 15 minute visit, you know, you could say, oh, like you should try to do these exercises, blah, 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 blah. Or, or you can just give somebody a pill that's going to make the, make their feelings go away. And I think we got complacent in that. Um, mm. not to say that certain people don't need pain medicine, certain, uh, of course. or, or certain people don't need, you know, cholesterol medicines, which I do want to touch about what different medicines and different things we could do, but we'll get there. I know it's, well, I know we're good on time. <laughs> oh, we're gonna um, have, we could talk about cholesterol medicine right now. Totally. All right. So it's all right that we're switching around. Uh, you know, our listeners can handle it. They love it. This is this way. This is how going. my brain works. I'm, I'm always you. in like 20 different places at once. So like a, a, a train of thought could just be in one direction and change. So are, you, are you about to talk about statins? Is that what you're going to talk about? Yeah. So let's do there's it. Like there's like 22 different types of cholesterol medicine, and they all lower the number, which is great. We don't, we don't treat people. We don't treat numbers. We treat people. So you can get you, that. You number. treat people. Everybody else treats I, numbers. Well, uh, I, I don't <laughs> want. I don't want to. I don't want to lump everybody in the same. Okay. Okay. Uh, fair. Um, but uh, you're right. The, for the majority of people, we just look at the number, and and the number is what we've been conditioned to look at. And yes, mm -hmm. there's a goal. There's a this. Uh, I mean, and I think uh, the community is starting to kind of. Uh, wrap their heads around this and like, because we used to just treat a number. If it was over a certain number, you got to get it under this. If you have certain risk factors, we got to get it under this. We've gotten such a better appreciation for what are markers of risk and markers of risk could be, um, well, age is like the biggest marker for everything, not to seem like an ageist, it's, but the older you true. are, the more likely you are to have things go wrong. Human sure. beings are not designed to live beyond 65 years old. We routinely do um but we're pushing our luck we, every day we are and i know that sounds like like, like uh i don't know I, I always think of everything that we do is kind of anti-darwin but uh <laughs> that's a, that's a conversation for a different day uh because um, because we keep out living when <laughs> there's no i know I, gotta so we're back, not. I, gotta back <laughs> I love that um, that's a, okay another episode so oh. survival of the fittest episode two okay <laughs> um but um so when we talk about these new risk factors and so inflammation is a part of it. So a, a high sensitivity CRP is a measure for in, inflammation in the heart. Then you can also see if somebody has plaque in a non-invasive way by doing things like the calcium score, by doing a CAT scan angiogram of your heart. So we are kind of getting into this mode where we're starting to think about it. We just don't delineate it as clearly as you and I talk about, it, even though we go off on all these tangents. So yes. out of all these different medications that are out there, um, lifestyle helps uh, to an enormous degree in bringing down that number. 
But the number is what we've come to realize is a piece of the equation, but it doesn't tell you the overall picture of what's going on uh, within your vasculature, whether that's to the brain, to the heart, to the legs, and, and um, kind of doing further investigations into this and knowing what can kind of change that plays a role in which different uh, pharmacology we use. Um, we have to talk about statins. Um, so out of the 22 different cholesterol medicines, statins have these vague anti-inflammatory properties, which if you got nothing out of this podcast is inflammation is the key to all of this. The rest okay, of wait, the wait. treatment, go ahead. You guys, I guess stop. I'm sorry. Cause you say it fast and I want my, my audience to appreciate it because you sent me these articles and it actually blew my mind. It took me a long time to read them because it was a lot of big words, but yeah, it, I, I, it was hard for me to digest too. <laughs> okay, I was like, oh my God, I don't have enough coffee, but I read them. And here's the thing that I really got from it. So the statins, you know, it came out and there was this conversation like, hey, they reduce cholesterol. So we use cholesterol. Great. If that was the case, and if it was just about reducing the cholesterol number, then it should be some time before we see an improvement in what's called, you know, the rate of morbidity, the likelihood that you'll die. It should take some time for these things to work. But what they discovered is that they were working pretty fast and that they were reducing morbidity, the, you know, the risk that you might die rather quickly. So how is it possible that if this is just about not producing more cholesterol, that it's working so quickly? And what they realized is that while yes, it is part of the cholesterol, cholesterol building mechanism, but what they realize is that these statins work because they're anti-inflammatory. So yep. taking these stands, thinking it's like some sort of chol um, cholesterol, I'm gonna say buster, not really, but but in fact, they're just anti-inflammatories. And if you just did the anti-inflammatory thing, <laughs> you wouldn't need the statin with all of its side effects. That's what you're saying, right? Yes. So like um, to for primary prevention without question. Okay. Um, for things like uh, this is... Uh, if you, if you've had a heart attack, if you have stents, if you have these things, the long-term patency of these has been well studied over like the course of like the last 30, 40 years. So like, those are the people who I will try to keep on these, on these as long as possible. I will lower the dose at, at, like to the minimum that you even have to do it, but for prevention and to kind of get out of this, which is my jam, uh, nip it in the bud early, lower yeah, so your inflammation, change your eating habits, do all of the things because the end result could be gnarly. So you're saying kind of like there's two groups of patients, right? There's a group of patients who already had an event or aren't yes. very likely to have an event. For those people, yes, medication statins are going to be part of the picture because yes, anti-inflammatory, but also we have to make sure we're not building any, any kind of plaques or anything because it was already an event. So why are we messing with it? But for those of us who have not had it and we're just dealing with cholesterol, consider the fact that if you're being put on this medication, one of the reasons it's working so well, one of the reasons is because it's an anti-inflammatory. A thousand percent. Yes. And, and any way that you can, that you can do that, um, I don't know, diet has played such a heavy role in this. Um, I don't know, I've become a lot more plant-based, uh, just based, yes. on, based on thinking about, about, uh, uh, all the research that like I've, I've like personally done to like this field. Um, I do do intermittent fasting, which I understand is not for everybody. For me, particularly, it works pretty well. Uh, and I still enjoy myself, but I keep a close eye on everything. I need to kind of make sure. And I feel it when I've... You overdo bad. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so just a quick recap, right? So intermittent fasting has... Um, I just did an episode on this one. I was like, intermittent fasting is not about weight loss. Like, yeah, you might lose some weight, but it's about being anti-inflammatory. Bottom line. It's why the aches yep. and pains go away. It's why you're clear headed. It's why it's why it's better for your heart. Anti-inflammatory. Um, and then you said plant-based. I have uh, my my reasons of why I think plant-based with some animal protein. When I say plant-based, I don't mean vegan, vegetarian. But what do you no, mean no. when you say plant-based? So for me, um, I do. I try to stay away. So the the easy things whenever because uh, we have limited time to get to talk to patients. I always am like. I'm like, look, these are the things that are bad for you. Uh, but if you can become more plant-based, try to try to decrease your animal fat products that you have, like saturated fats are like one of the worst things you can do. They're prone. Th this is like the, the saturated fats could be like the, the nexus of this lecture. They are pro-inflammatory and they are pro-cholesterol 
uh, factors. So if you can minimize those as well as promoting your intakes of unprocessed fruits, vegetables, nuts, berries, um, while also getting in some animal protein, like I love fish, I love chicken, try to stay away from red meat as much as you can, but like have a juicy steak if, if you feel like it every once in a while. Not yeah. telling you to do it every day, but, and there are people who do, but. Yes, there are people uh, who do. So I'm, I'm but, more on your page. I, I tell people eat the rainbow, not Skittles. Look at your plate, make sure you're purposely choosing color because each one of those colors has a phytonutrient. So, you know, go outside of your comfort zone, eat the weird bok choy or something that you wouldn't usually eat. Everything sauteing and garlic is delicious. And then, yes. <laughs> and then have a, a piece of animal protein, unless you're ethically against it. Um, and I think that's kind of like the ideal. There are some cardiologists out there, functional cardiologists. I'm purposely saying cardiologists because these are people who are well versed just as you are, in, but they're in the functional world who are actually more pro carnivore. And I have yet to figure out why. I look forward to talk to them. Um, just want to say it out there for people. Um, it's not where I stand, it's not where Dr. Spagnola stands, but no. they do exist. Um, so, but I'm also not saying vegan vegetarian because I have to tell you, I have a lot of vegan vegetarians who are coming in diabetic because they're eating potato chips all day. Oh, you could, uh, I think this was your line, and I love I, I, uh, when we had dinner uh, the first time we met in person, and you were like, No, you could be you could be vegan and you can eat Oreos all day. Yeah, <laughs> you're vegan, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly exactly right and be full of inflammation and all these other things that's amazing um okay so i want to wrap this up because i know you have to get to your family um so i'm going to put of course in our links uh at the end of the show where you can see dr spagnola dr spagnola works for those of you who listen to us nationally unfortunately he only works in new york and in staten island so if you want to see him you got to come in here um but for those of you who are local he takes insurance so hurry up and get there any and all i have to treat everybody any, any and all he's amazing but do you have any message or anything that you'd want to leave the audience with i know i'm putting you on the spot but let's try it out um i i think if you want to talk about prevention I'm, i i definitely think we could talk about that if you want to as a patient um it's a big part of everything that i do which i think is why you and i work so well together because we we talk about uh, a lot of these things and a lot of interesting patients like uh, um, and management decisions. Uh, I don't think I don't like the idea of cookbook medicine. and We've kind of mm -hmm. gone too far down this road. Um, but the only way you can really get individualized care is if you have individualized relationships with your patients. So again, all of these things kind of play uh, a role hand in hand. And like I said, myself, my partners are all along the same pages with this. Um, and if, if that sounds like your cup of tea, uh, please come and see me. Um, would love to chat with you, whether it's about cardiology, whether it's about this, but talking about a healthy lifestyle, I think an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of uh, treatment. Amen. I love that. Um, thank you so much for your time. This has been amazing. I really hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I did. I plan to bring on more guests in the future, but until then, if you want to reach me and my team, it's the new method and just about every platform except for Twitter because I talk too much. The new method is spelled with a K because you always knew there was a better way. I'll talk to you guys soon.